They called him the playmaker. I was catching everything. That was good. That was very good. <laughs> Star of America's most celebrated team. This was Michael Irvin's town. Everybody loved Michael Irvin. But not everybody loved Michael Irvin. Somebody wants to kill my husband? It's like I have no choice. Either he's going to kill me or I should kill him. This is Michael Irvin. Yes! Beyond the glory. Absolutely outstanding. Unbelievable. I just put in the heat that on baseball. Do you have anything to say to your fans? Michael Jerome Irvin was born in 1966 in a rundown section of Fort Lauderdale called Golden Heights. He was the 15th of 17 children in a struggling family. As a young boy, Michael was determined to hit the big time. Michael Irvin's gonna play in the NFL, and that's all I ever worked toward. And I wasn't the most talented guy, but I knew I would outwork everybody. And by the end of his senior year at St. Thomas Aquinas High, he was one of the top football prospects in the country. In 1985, Michael became a hurricane. He chose Miami because it was a winning program, and it was close to home. Now at the next level, Michael earned a reputation as the hardest working athlete on the team. He always had a saying, I got to go run 10 laps because the next man might be doing 11. I worked to become the best at playing wide receiver. I would get my quarterback, and we would go run routes for hours. And then I would run home, and this was miles. I mean, just run. Michael rewrote the Hurricane record books, catching 143 passes for over 2,400 yards and 26 touchdowns. I walked into Miami knowing it was it. I'll, I'll get in the NFL. That was it. His scholarship called for a weekly stipend of $30, and he delivered it directly to his mother with a promise. I told my mother, when I get in leave, baby, I don't have to do this anymore. I'm going to be CEO of Michael Irvin Incorporated. In the final game of his college career, he led Miami to an Orange Bowl victory and the national championship. He got it! Touchdown, Miami! His stock with NFL scouts could not have been higher. It was time to get out of college now and go try it in the pros and see if I can do it there. Then came the day Michael Irvin had waited for all his life. And they said, Dallas picks Michael Irvin, the University of Miami, and the whole place gets extinct. That house looked like the top of it a blew up. Dallas Cowboys! <laughs> Super Bowl bound next year! Super Bowl bound! But the Cowboys were a team in turmoil. There's a lot of older guys in Dallas, and I just didn't see the desire to win like I experienced in college. The following year, new owner Jerry Jones shook things up. He forced out legendary coach Tom Landry and replaced him with Michael's college coach, Jimmy Johnson. Johnson knew exactly what his young receiver could do if given the opportunity. He's an overachiever with talent. And uh, when you have that, you have a special player. Michael was poised to launch himself into an elite group of NFL receivers. But his hopes crashed down as he landed hard on Texas Stadium's artificial turf. I had never really been injured. All I'm thinking about was, I just got here. The ligaments in his right knee were seriously injured. Doctors didn't know if Michael would ever play football again. He was in a lot of pain. And he kept saying, Sandy, Sandy. And I was like, oh, my God, because it was like night and day. He was just a different person. What am I going to do now? How am I going to take care of my mother? I went into depression. I remember thinking before that, how can somebody commit suicide? How can, some, how can they get to that? I got there. I got there on a knee injury because I could not play the game. The following season, Michael Irvin returned and was better than ever. Touchdown, Dallas! During his absence, two Dallas teammates became standouts, 
quarterback Troy Aikman, and running back Emmett Smith. Emmett was on the field. Troy was on the field. I was on the field. Oh, we see what this can be. Troy and I can run 10 different routes with blindfolds and catch six balls. That's how good we were. The following year, in 1991, Irvin led the NFL in receiving yards and the NFC in catches. His trademark was the quick slant across the middle. For wide receivers, this was the equivalent of a suicide mission. People often talk about, man, you have so much courage to go across the middle. Given the options, you go across the middle or you don't take care of your family. You go across the middle or you go back to the poorhouse. You go across the middle and you don't make any money. It becomes real simple then, you go across the middle. In the summer of 92, the Cowboys signed Urban to a $4 million contract, making him the club's highest paid player. He dropped the first hundred grand on a custom black Mercedes with Playmaker inscribed on the plates. That season, the Cowboys ruled the NFL. Then in the Super Bowl, Irvin's two touchdown catches helped Dallas cruise to a one-sided victory over the Bills. The following year, they did it again. Aikman down the middle, wide open, Michael Irvin. After back-to-back -back Super Bowl championships, Dallas erupted. Riding the crest of the pandemonium was Michael Irvin. This was Michael Irvin's town. Everybody loved Michael Irvin. Success went to his head. Although married, Michael flaunted his celebrity openly. Boy, I would have some fun. <laughs> you fool yourself like you have some form of control. You know, the getting high, the drinking, the women. I got control of this. I can stop when I want to. Stories of wild orgies thrown by Irvin and other Dallas players circulated all over town. The reported location, a private residence known as the White House, conveniently located near the Cowboys practice facility. Let's put in some money and get a house so we don't all have to be going into a hotel with women and smoking and drinking, getting high and all that. Let's get out the house. When his longtime coach heard the stories, he confronted Michael. Michael, I said, you know, I'm not making any accusations, but uh, our people, you know, tell me that you're going to the wrong places, you're hanging out with the wrong people. But Johnson was no longer able to intervene when he left the team in 1995. The hardworking Michael Irvin was an undisputed star on football's center stage. Few could have anticipated his next act. Dallas police are investigating charges of aggravated sexual assault against Cowboys receiver Michael Irvin. It was cocaine, alcohol. I said, honey, this has got to stop. By 1996, his talent for catching footballs had brought Michael Irvin everything he'd ever wished for. Fame, riches, security for his family. Still, he felt there was something missing. You keep looking for other things to gratify you, gratify you. What's next, what's next, what's the next level? The drinking and the going out to start coming over into the season. And it, and it, and it got out of hand. You just know that something has to happen to wake him up. On March 3, 1996, two days before Michael's 30th birthday, he and his former teammate, Alfredo Roberts, flew back to Dallas from an autograph convention. They decided to stop off at a small late night gathering at the Residence Inn in Irving, Texas, just outside of Dallas. As far as he and I were concerned, we were gonna go into to a nightclub later, so we weren't planning on being there very long. The hotel was a reputed site of huge Sunday night parties involving cowboy players, exotic dancers, and a plentiful supply of drugs. Eventually
Eventually, the hotel staff grew weary of the famous crowd and their shady activities. The manager definitely called the police and said, you know, these guys come over here sometime and they be partying with some women. Why don't we set something up for next time they come by? On this particular night, the only ones present were Irvin, Roberts, and a pair of topless dancers. Yet the manager chose to call the police. The cops found marijuana and cocaine in the room. They confiscate the drugs, and they arrest one girl whose name the room is in. And they said, well, guys, it's in her name. So they let me go home. And three or four weeks later, the media found out, and they put pressure on the cops and the police had to reopen the case. Then, of course, they prosecute me and let Alfredo go. I don't care if you're Michael Irvin or you're Joe Blow out on the street. Uh, when you're arrested in possession of a narcotic drug, you're going to get prosecuted. I remember meeting with the DA. He said, Michael, you know what I think? I think you're a piece of shit. Hey, his exact words. I remember, he said, I'm going to fillet you like a fish and leave you in the alley. Answering a subpoena, Irvin showed up in grand style. You want to make this a show? All right, so let's make it a show. Anybody that would walk into the courthouse in Dallas County, Texas, with a fur coat on, with sunglasses on, is quite arrogant. That's a person that believes he can never be convicted. One of the DA's witnesses was Rochelle Smith, a topless dancer and frequent Sunday night partier. Though she was not present on the night the hotel was raided, her testimony led to Irvin's indictment on two counts of drug possession. Once the trial began, it quickly turned into a media circus. Rochelle Smith insisted that Michael threatened to have her killed for testifying against him. I'm some mafia guy. You know, Michael Irvin uh, pressures on Rochelle Smith. This, these headlines. Then came another shocker. Smith's boyfriend, Dallas cop Johnny Hernandez, was arrested for hiring a hitman to kill Irvin. Once Rochelle told me the sincerity of, of, the, of the threats with Michael Irvin, I really felt like my life was definitely going to be in danger also. But the hitman turned out to be a federal agent and Hernandez was arrested. It was like a, a, a movie or something. You know, it just didn't seem real. You know, it's like somebody wants to kill my husband. Johnny Hernandez pled guilty to solicitation of capital murder and was sentenced to six years. It was later reduced to two and a half. The DA offered Michael a plea bargain. Four years probation and 800 hours of community service in return for a no contest plea to felony drug possession. Please don't put yourself in a position where you have to come back in front of me and try to explain why you did not do what I asked you to do. If you do that, the discussions will be limited and you're looking at up to 20 years in the penitentiary. Michael was more than ready to put his problems behind him and focus on football. But the playmaker just couldn't elude his troubles. I don't know anything about anything. What? Rape. Come on, man. What, how much sense does that make? After a very public trial that included allegations of drugs, women, and murder, Michael Irvin was ready to return to the place where his celebrity began, the football field. Football was always my getaway. Touchdown, Empty here, football will fill that. Whatever it is, football will take care of it. Although he faced four years of close monitoring and drug testing, the worst, he thought, was behind him. He could not have been more wrong. Topless dancer Nina Sharavan accused Irvin and teammate Eric Williams of raping her and videotaping the act. When the police first bust through my, my door, they said, where's Michael Irvin? You know, right off the bat. 
I'm like, Michael Irvin? Michael Irvin hasn't been over my house in over two years. I'm on probation. And I'm sitting there, and I'm trying to figure to myself, why would some woman do that to me? I haven't done anything in any way, shape, or form to violate my probation. It just seemed like um, it was getting worse, you know? It really did. But the sensational story never reached its climax. It was turned out it was a made-up story. It was something that was uh, uh, basically a conspiracy. It was all false. The whole thing was a lie. When all that came down and the way it came about, it, it, it hurt Michael, it hurt Eric, it hurt, it hurt the ball club, it hurt people around with false allegations. At that point, I asked Michael to leave Dallas. I said, you know, Mike, it's just not worth it. Get out of there. Michael returned to the only sanctuary he knew and began to reestablish himself as one of the game's premier pass catchers. Touchdown to Urban! In 1997 and 1998, Michael put up big numbers, averaging over 1,000 receiving yards per season. But the Cowboys were in decline. Their Super Bowl dominance was but a fading memory. October 1999, nearly three years after the drug and sex scandals that branded him a villain, Michael Irvin went down hard in a game against the Philadelphia Eagles. He heard something pop in his neck. Picked up about eight. Michael Irvin stays down. When I laid on that carpet, all I could think about at the time was, man, I'm not gonna play with my kids again. Michael recovered the movement in his arms and legs, but it had been a close call. Doctors warned him that another hard hit could leave him paralyzed. In July of 2000, Michael Irvin retired from football. It was hard leaving the game. Football was everything to me. That was his lowest point. And um, it had to happen. To hear what God wanted to say to him, you know. But Michael Irvin wasn't ready to listen. Not yet. We found uh, a half of a joint behind the couch. And they arrested me. I love playing the game. Uh, and, and I lie to you if I tell you, listening to these doctors uh, the last couple of days hadn't been hard. In 1999, a neck injury forced Michael Irvin to retire from the game he loved. It's, for me, it's a sad day, but, but, but it's a great day. It's hard to say goodbye. There's nothing you'll ever experience like playing football. Uh, there's just nothing that you can ever replace. It was hard. It was as hard as it get. Hoping to move into a career in broadcasting, Michael was offered a job by Fox Sports Net. But a few weeks later, members of a drug enforcement task force broke down the door of a North Dallas apartment rented to a suspected heroin dealer. They found ecstasy, marijuana, and Michael Irvin. They found a half a joint behind the couch and they arrested me. Swept up again in a wave of negative publicity, Michael withdrew from the job with Fox Sports. Charges were later dropped when it was disclosed that police searched the apartment without a warrant. Without football or a career in television, Michael's life was in flux. I knew that Michael was coming. I didn't know how, but I knew he was coming to Christ soon. I had to make my peace with God on everything and stop trying to control things I, and understand I didn't have football. I didn't have football to run to. I had to get connected back with Jesus. It had taken half a lifetime, but Michael Irvin had last found what he'd been looking for. I knew God was there. I, I don't think I could get to where I was in life 
without having his hand upon me all the time? Will some of the things that I went through keep me out of the Hall of Fame? I don't know. The things I've accomplished on the field cannot be taken away from me. You can say whatever you will about whatever I experienced off the field, but whenever you fix your mouth to talk about me playing football, you will say he played football. Thank you.